Hello, and welcome back to Living Pages. Tonight, we'll take another adventure similar to last time. Several poems included with a short story. Here we go. The Vampire by Conrad Aiken. She rose among us where we lay. She wept, we put our work away. She chilled our laughter, stilled our play, and spread a silence there. A darkness shot across the sky, and once and twice we heard her cry, and saw her lift her hands on high, and toss her troubled hair. What shape was this who came to us with basilisk eyes so ominous, with mouth so sweet, so poisonous, and tortured hands so pale? We saw her wavering to and fro. Through dark and wind we saw her go. Yet what her name was did not know and felt our spirits fail. We tried to turn away, but still, above we heard her sorrow thrill, and those that slept, they dreamed of ill and dreadful things. Of skies grown red with rending flames, and shuddering hills that cracked their frames, of twilights foul with wings. And skeletons dancing to a tune, and cries of children stifled soon, and over all a blood-red moon, a dull and nightmare sighs. They woke and sought to go their ways, yet everywhere they met her gaze, her fixed and burning eyes. Who are you now? we cried to her. Spirit so strange and sinister, we felt dead winds above us stir, and in the darkness heard a voice fall singing, cloying sweet, heavily dropping through that heat, heavy as a honeyed pulse's beat, slow word by anguished word. And though the night strange music went, with voice and cry so darkly blent. We could not fathom what they meant, save only that they seemed to thin the blood along our veins, foretelling vile, delirious pains, and clouds divulging blood-red rains upon a hill undreamed. And this we heard, who dies for me, he shall possess me secretly, and terrible beauty he shall see, and slake my body's flame. But who denies me, cursed shall be, and slain and buried loathsomely, and slimed upon with shame. And darkness fell, and like a sea of stumbling deaths, we followed we, who dared not stay behind. There, all night long, beneath a cloud, we rose and fell, we struck and bowed. We were the plowmen and the plowed. Our eyes were red and blind. And some, they said, had touched her side before she fled us there. And some had taken her to bride. And some lay down for her and died, who had not touched her hair, ran to and fro and cursed and cried and sought her everywhere. Her eyes have feasted on the dead and small and shapely is her head and dark and small her mouth, they said, and beautiful to kiss. Her mouth is sinister and red as blood in moonlight is. Then poets forgot their jeweled words and cut the sky with glittering swords, and innocent souls turned carrion birds to perch upon the dead. 
Sweet daisy fields were drenched with death. The air became a charnel breath. Pale stones were splashed with red. Green leaves were dappled bright with blood, and fruit trees murdered in the bud. And when at length the dawn came green as twilight from the east, and all that heaving horror ceased, silent was every bird and beast, and that dark voice was gone. No word was there, no song, no bell, no furious tongue that dreamed to tell, only the dead who rose and fell above the wounded men. And whisperings and wails of pain blown slowly from the wounded grain, blown slowly from the smoking plain, and silence fell again. Until at dusk, from God knows where, beneath dark birds that filled the air, like one who did not hear or care, under a blood-red cloud. An aged plowman came alone, and drove his share through flesh and bone, and turned them under to mold and stone. All night long he plowed. The Haunted Place by Edgar Allan Poe. In the greenest of our valleys, by good angels tenanted, once a fair and stately palace, radiant palace, reared its head. In the monarch thought's dominion, it stood there, never spareth spread opinion over fabric half so fair. Banners yellow, glorious, golden, on its roof did float and flow. This, all this, was in the olden time long ago. And every gentle air that dallied in that sweet day, along the ramparts plumed and pallid, a winged odor went away. Wanderers in that happy valley, through two luminous windows, saw spirits moving musically to a lute's well-tuned law, round about a throne where sitting poor Phrygini, in state this glory well befitting, the ruler of the realm was seen. And all with pearl and ruby glowing was the fair palace door, through which came flowing, 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 and sparkling evermore, a troop of echoes whose sweet duty was but to sing, in voices of surpassing beauty, the wit and wisdom of their king. But evil things, in robes of sorrow, assailed the monarch's high estate, Ah, let us mourn, for never morrow shall dawn upon him desolate. And round about his home the glory that blushed and bloomed is but a dim remembered story of the old time entombed. And travelers now within that valley through the red litten windows see vast forms that move fantastically to a discordant melody, while like a ghastly rapid river through the pale door, a hideous throng rush out forever and laugh, but smile no more. Lenore by Edgar Allan Poe. Ah, broken is the golden bowl the spirit flown forever. Let the bell toll, a sanity soul floats on the Stygian river. And Guy de Vere, hast thou no tear? Weep now or never more. See, on yon drear and rigid bier, low lies thy love, Lenore. Come, let the burial rite be read, the funeral song be sung. An anthem for the queenliest dead that ever died so young. 
a dirge for her, the doubly dead, in that she died so young. Wretches, ye loved her for her wealth, and hated her for her pride. And when she fell in feeble health, ye blessed her that she died. How shall the ritual then be read, the requiem how be sung? By you, by yours, the evil eye, by yours, the slanderous tongue, that did to death the innocent that died, and died so young. Pecavimus, but rave not thus, and let a Sabbath song go up to God so solemnly the dead may feel so wrong. The sweet Lenore hath gone before, with hope that flew beside, leaving thee wild for the dear child that should have been thy bride. For her, the fair and debonair, that now so lowly lies, the life upon her yellow hair, but not within her eyes. The life still there upon her hair, the death upon her eyes. Avant, tonight my heart is light, no dirge will I upraise, but waft the angel on her flight with a peon of old days. Lest no bell toll, lest her sweet soul, amid its hallowed mirth, should catch the note as it doth float up from the damned earth. To friends above, from fiends below, the indignant ghost is riven from hell and to a high estate, far up within the heaven. From grief and groan, a golden throne beside the king of heaven. Darkness by George Gordon. I had a dream, which was not all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished, and the stars did wander darkling in the eternal space, rayless and passing. And the icy earth swung blind and blackening in the moonless air. Morn came and went, came and brought no day. And men forgot their passions in the dread of this, their desolation, and all hearts were chilled into a selfish prayer for light. And they did live by watch fires, and the thrones, the palaces of crowned kings, the huts, the habitations of all things which dwell, were burnt for beacons, cities were consumed, and men were gathered round their blazing homes to look once more into each other's face. Happy were those who dwelt within the eye of the volcanoes and their mountain torch. A fearful hope was all the world contained. Forests were set on fire, but hour by hour they fell and faded, and the crackling trunks extinguished with a crash and all was black. The brows of men by the despairing light were an unearthly aspect, as by fits the flashes fell upon them. Some lay down and hid their eyes and wept, and some did rest their chins upon their clenched hands and smiled. And others hurried to and fro and fed their funeral piles with fuel and looked up with mad disquietude on the dull sky, the pall of a past world, and then again, with curses, cast them down upon the dust, and gnashed their teeth, and howled, wild birds free, and terrified did flutter on the ground, and flapped their useless wings. The wildest brutes came tame and tremulous, and vipers crawled and twined themselves among the multitude, hissing but stingless. They were slain for food. And war, which for a moment was no more, did glut himself again. A meal was bought with blood, and each state, sullenly apart, gorging himself in gloom. 
no love was left. All earth was but one thought, and that was death. Immediate and inglorious, and the pang of famine fed upon all entrails, men died, and their bones were tombless as their flesh. The meager by the meager were devoured, even dogs assailed their masters, all save one, and he was faithful to a chorus, and kept the birds and beasts and famished men at bay, till hunger clung them, or the dripping dead lured their lank jaws, himself thought out no food, but with a piteous and perpetual moan, and a quick desolate cry, licking the hand which answered not with a caress. He died. The crowd was famished by degrees, but two of an enormous city did survive, and they were enemies. They met beside the dying embers of an altar place, where had been heaped a mass of unholy things for an unholy usage. They racked up, and shivering scraped with their cold skeleton hands the feeble ashes and their feeble breath, food for a little life, and made a flame which was a mockery. Then they lifted up their eyes as it grew lighter, and beheld each other's aspects, saw and shrieked, and died. Even of their mutual hideousness, they died, unknowing who he was, upon whose brow famine had written fiend. The world was void. The populace and the powerful was a lump, seasonless, herbless, treeless, manless, lifeless. A lump of death, a chaos of hard clay. The rivers, lakes, and oceans all stood still, and nothing stirred within their silent depths. Ships, sailorless, lay rotting on the sea, and their masts fell down piecemeal as they dropped. They slept on the abyss without a surge. The waves were dead. The tides were in their grave. The moon, their mistress, had expired before. The winds were withered in the stagnant air, and the clouds perished. Darkness had no need of aid from them. She was the universe. The Spider and the Fly, Mary Howitt. Will you walk into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. "'Tis the prettiest little parlor that you ever did spy. "'The way into my parlor is up a winding stair, "'and I have many pretty things to show you when you are there.' "'Oh, no, no,' said the little fly. "'To ask me is in vain, "'for who goes up your winding stair can ne'er come down again.' "'I'm sure you must be weary, dear.' with soaring up so high. Will you rest upon my little bed? Said the spider to the fly. There are pretty curtains drawn around. The sheets are fine and thin. And if you like to rest a while, I'll snugly tuck you in. Oh, no, no, said the little fly. I've often heard it said, they never, never wake again who sleep upon your bed said the cunning spider to the fly dear friend what shall i do to prove the warm affection i've always felt for you i have within my pantry good store of all that's nice i'm sure you're very welcome will you please take a slice oh no no said the little fly kind sir that cannot be I've heard what's in your pantry, and I do not wish to see. Sweet creature, said the spider, you're witty and you're wise. 
How handsome are your gauzy wings? How brilliant are your eyes? I have a little looking glass upon my parlor shelf. If you'll step in one moment, dear, you shall behold yourself. <laughs> Thank you, gentle sir, she said, for what you're pleased to say, and bidding you good morning now. I'll call another day. The spider turned him round about and went into his den. For well he knew the silly fly would soon be back again. So he wove a subtle web in a little corner sly and set his table ready to dine upon the fly. Then he came out to his door again and merrily did sing, Come hither, hither, pretty fly, with the pearl and silver wing. Your robes are green and purple. There's a crest upon your head. Your eyes are like the diamond bright, but mine are dull as lead. Alas, alas, how very soon this silly little fly, hearing his wily, flattering words, came slowly flitting by. With buzzing wings she hung aloft, the near and nearer she drew. Thinking only of her brilliant eyes and green and purple hue. Thinking only of her crested head, poor foolish thing. At last he jumped upon the cunning spider and fiercely held her fast. He dragged her up his winding stair and into his dismal den within his little parlor. But she never came out again. And now, dear little children, who may this story read? To idle, silly, flattering words, I pray you ne'er give heed. Unto an evil counselor, close heart and ear and eye, and take a lesson from this tale of the spider and the fly. Haunted Houses Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. All houses wherein men have lived and died are haunted houses. Through the open doors, the harmless phantoms on their errands glide. With feet that make no sound upon the floors, we meet them at the doorway. There, along the passages, they come and go, impalpable impressions on the air. A sense of something moving to and fro. There are more guests at table than the hosts invited. The illuminated hall is thronged and quiet. Inoffensive ghost, as silent as the pictures on the wall. The stranger at my fireside cannot see the forms I see, nor hear the sounds I hear. But he perceives what is, while unto me, all that has been visible is clear. We have no title deeds to house or lands, owners and occupants of earlier dates, from graves forgotten, stretch their dusty hands and hold in Mort Main still their old estates. The spirit world around this world of sense floats like an atmosphere, and everywhere wafts through these earthly mists and vapors dense. A vital breath of more ethereal air, our little lives are kept in equipoise by opposite attractions and desires. The struggle of the instinct that enjoys and the more noble instinct that aspires. These perturbations, this perpetual jar of earthly wants and aspirations high, come from the influence of an unseen star, an undiscovered planet in our sky. And as the moon from some dark gate of cloud throws o'er the sea a floating bridge of light, across whose trembling planks our fancies crowd into the realm of mystery and night. So from the world of spirits there descends a bridge of light 
connecting it with this? Or whose unsteady floor that sways and bends wander our thoughts above the dark abyss? Next we have a series of poems by A. E. Hausman, all of which are the title of their first line. Her strong enchantments failing, her towers of fear in wreck, her limb decks dried of poison, and the knife at her neck. The queen of air and darkness begins to shrill and cry, O oh, young man, O oh, my slayer! Tomorrow you shall die. O oh, queen of air and darkness, I think tis truth you say. And I shall die tomorrow, but you will die today. Bells in the Tower. Bells in Tower at evening toll, and the day forsakes the soul. Soon will evening self be gone, and the whispering night come on. Blame not thou the blinded light, nor the whisper of the night. Though the whispering night were still, yet the heart would counsel ill. Others, I am not the first, have wild more mischief than they durst. If in the breathless night I too shiver now, tis nothing new. More than I, if truth were told, have stood and sweated hot cold, and through their rains and fire and ice, fear contented with desire. Aguewed once like me they were, but I like them shall win my way. Lastly, to the bed of mold, where there's neither heat nor cold. But from my grave across my brow plays no wind healing now, and fire and ice within me fight beneath the suffocating night. The immortal part, when I meet the morning beam, or lay me down at night to dream, I hear my bones within me say, another night, another day. When shall this sloth of sense be cast? This dust of thoughts be laid at last. The man of flesh and soul be slain, and the man of bone left to remain. This tongue that talks, these lungs that shout, these thews that hustle us about, this brain that fills the skull with schemes and its humming hive. These today are proud in power and lord it in their little hour. The immortal bones obey control of dying flesh and dying soul. Is long till eve and morn are gone, slow the endless night comes on. And late to fullness grows the birth that shall last as long as the earth. Wanderers eastward Wanderers west, know you why you cannot rest? Tis that every mother's son travails with a skeleton. Lie down in the bed of dust, bear the fruit that bear you must. Bring the eternal seed to light, and morn is all the same as night. Rest you so from trouble sore. Fear the heat of the sun no more. Nor the snowing winter wild. Now you labor not with child. Empty vessel, garment cast. We that wore you long shall last. Another night, another day. So my bones within me say. Therefore they shall do my will today. While I am master still, 
and flesh and soul, now both are strong, shall hail sullen slaves along. Before this fire of sense decay, this smoke of thought blow clean away and leave with ancient night alone the steadfast and enduring bone. A Dream Within a Dream by Edgar Allan Poe. Take this kiss upon the brow, and in parting from you now, thus much let me avow, you are not wrong to deem that my days have been a dream. Yet, if hope has flown away in a night or in a day, in a vision or in none, is it therefore the less gone? All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. I stand amid the roar of a surf-tormented shore, and I hold within my hand grain of the golden sand. How few, yet how they creep through my fingers to the deep. While I weep, while I weep, oh God, can I not grasp them with? A tighter clasp. Oh God, can I not save one from the pitiless wave? Is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream? Because I could not stop for death. Emily Dickinson. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility. We passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of gazing grain. We passed the setting sun. Or rather, he passed us. The, drew, the dews drew quivering and chill, for only gossamer, my gown, my tippet, only tool. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Since then, tis centuries, and yet, Feels shorter than the day I first surmised the horse's heads were toward eternity. The Little Ghost, Edna St. Vincent Millay. I knew her for a little ghost that in my garden walked. The wall is high, higher than most, and the green gate was locked, and yet I did not think of that till after she was gone. I knew her by her broad white hat, all ruffled she had on. By the dear ruffles round her feet, by her small hands that hung, and their lace mitts austere and sweet. Her gown's white folds among. I watched to see if she would stay, what she would do, and oh! She looked as if she liked the way I let my garden grow. She bent above my favorite mint with conscious garden grace. She smiled and smiled. There was no hint of sadness in her face. She held her gown to either side to let her slippers show. And up the walk she went with pride, the way great ladies go. And where the wall is built in new and is of ivy bare, she paused, then opened and passed through a gate that once was there. Song of the Witches, Double, Double, Toil and Trouble by William Shakespeare from Macbeth. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble, 
fillet of a fenny snake in the cauldron boil and bake eye of newt and toe of frog wool of bat and tongue of dog adder's fork and blind worm's sting lizard's leg and howlet's wing for a charm of powerful trouble like a hell broth boil and bubble double double boil and trouble fire burn and cauldron bubble cool it with a baboon's blood then the charm is firm and good halloween by joel benton Pixie, Cobalt, Elf, and Sprite, all are on their rounds tonight. In the wan moon's silver ray, thrives their helter skelter play. Fond of cellar, barn, or stack, true unto the almanac, they present to credulous eyes strange hobgoblin mysteries. Cabbage stumps, straws wet with dew, apple skins, and chestnuts too, and a mirror for some lass show what wonders come to pass. Doors they move, and gates they hide, mischiefs that on moonbeams ride are their deeds, and by their spells love records its oracle. Don't we all of long ago by the ruddy fireplace glow? In the kitchen and the hall, queer, hoof-like pranks recall. Every shadows were they then, but tonight they come again. Where we once more but sixteen, precious would be Halloween. Yule Horror by H.P. Lovecraft. There is snow on the ground, and the valleys are cold. And a midnight profound, black, blots o'er the wold. But a light on the hilltops hath seen hints of festerings unhallowed and old. There is death in the clouds, there is fear in the night, for the dead in their shrouds hail the sin's turning flight. And chant wild in the woods as they dance round a Yule altar, fungus and white. To no gale of earth's kind sways the forest of oak, where the sick bows entwined by mad mistletoes choke. For these powers are the powers of the dark, from the graves of the lost druid folk. Nemesis by H.P. Lovecraft. Through the ghoul guarded gateways of slumber, past the wan mooned abysses of night, I have lived o'er my lives without number. I have sounded all things with my sight. And I struggle and shriek ere the day break, being driven to madness. I have whirled with the earth at the dawning, when the sky was a vaporous flame. I have seen the dark universe yawning, where the black planets roll without aim. Where they roll in their horror unheeded, without knowledge or luster or name. I had drifted o'er seas without ending, under sinister gray clouded skies that the many-forked lightning is rending, that resound with hysterical cries, with the moans of invisible demons that out of the green waters rise. I have plunged like a deer through the arches of the hoary primordial grove, where the oaks feel the present that marches and stalks on, where no spirit dares rove. And I flee from a thing that surrounds me and leers through dead branches above. I have stumbled by cave-ridden mountains 
that rise barren and bleak from the plain. I have drunk of the fog-fetid fountains that ooze down to the marsh and the main. And in hot, cursed tarns, I have seen things I care not to gaze on again. I have scanned the vast ivy-clad palace. I have trod its untenanted hall, where the moon rising up from the valleys shows the tapestry thing on the wall. Strange figures discordantly woven that I cannot endure to recall. I have peered from the casements in wonder at the moldering meadows around, at the many-roofed village laid under the curse of a grave-girdled ground. And from rows of white urn carven marble, I listen intently for a sound. I have haunted the tombs of the ages. I have flown on the pinions of fear, where the smoke belching Erebus rages, where the Jokuls loom snow-clad and drear. And in realms where the sun of the desert consumes what it can never cheer. I was old when the pharaohs first mounted the jewel-decked throne of the Nile. I was old in those epochs uncounted when I, and I only, was vile. And man, yet untainted and happy, dwelt in bliss on the far Arctic Isle. Oh, great was the sin of my spirit, and great is the reach of its doom. Not the pity of heaven can cheer it, nor the respite be found in the tomb. Down the infinite eons come beating the wings of unmerciful gloom. Through the ghoul-guarded gateways of slumber, past the wan-mooned abysses of night, I have lived o'er my lives without number. I have sounded all things with my sight. And I struggle and shriek ere the day break, being driven to madness with fright. Ghost, Walter de la Mer. Who knocks? I, who was beautiful, beyond all dreams to restore. I, from the roots of the dark thorn, am hither, and knock on the door. Who speaks? I, once was my speech, sweet as the birds on the air, when echo lurks by the waters to heed, as I speak thee fair. Dark is the hour, I am cold, lone is my house, ah, but mine, sight, touch, lips, ears yearned in vain. Long dead, these to thine. Silent, still faint on the porch, break the flames of the stars. In gloom groped, a hope-wearied hand over keys, bolts, and bars. A face peered, all the gray night in chaos of vacancy shone. Not but vast sorrow was there, the sweet cheat gone. Ghosts by Ella Wheeler Wilcox There are ghosts in the room, as I sit here alone, from the dark corners there. They come out of the gloom, and they stand at my side, and they lean upon my chair. There's the ghost of a hope that lighted my days with a fanciful glow. In her hand is the rope that strangled her life out. Hope was slain long ago. But her ghost comes tonight with its skeleton face and expressionless eyes, and it stands in the light and mocks me and jeers me with sobs and terrible sighs. There's the ghost of a joy, a frail, fragile thing. 
and I prized it too much. And the hands that destroy clasped it close, and it died at the withering touch. There's the ghost of a love, born with a joy, reared with hope, died in pain and unrest. But the towers above all the others, this ghost, yet a ghost at the best. I am weary and fain, would forget all these dead, but the gibbering host make my struggle in vain. In each shadowy corner there lurketh a ghost. Mary's Ghost, a pathetic ballad by Thomas Hood. It was in the middle of the night to sleep young William tried when Mary's ghost came stealing in and stood at his bedside. Oh, William, dear, oh, William, dear, my rest eternal ceases. Alas, my everlasting peace broken into pieces. I thought the last of all my cares would end with my last minute. But though I went to my long home, I didn't stay long in it. The body snatchers, they have come and made a snatch at me. It's very hard, them kind of men won't let a body be. And thought that I was buried deep, quite decent-like and cherry. But from her grave in Mary Bone, They've come and boned your Mary. The arm that used to take your arm is took to Dr. Vice, and both my legs are gone to walk the hospital at Guy's. I vowed that you should have my hand, but fate gives us denial. You'll find it there at Dr. Bell's in spirits and a file. As for my feet, the little feet you used to call so pretty, there's one I know in Bedford Row, the t'others in the city. I can't tell where my head is gone, but Dr. Carpu can. As for my trunk, it's all packed up to go by Pickford's van. I wish you'd go to Mr. P and save me such a ride. I don't half like the outside place they took from my inside. The cock it crows, I must be gone. My William, we must part. But I'll be yours in death, although Sir Astley has my heart. Don't go weep upon my grave and think that there I be. They haven't left an atom there of my anatomy. Astrophobos by H.P. Lovecraft. In the midnight heavens burning, through the ethereal deeps afar, once I watched with restless yearning an alluring auric star. Every eve aloft returning, gleaming nigh the Arctic car. Mystic waves of beauty blended with the gorgeous golden rays, fantasies of bliss descended in a murd Elysian haze. In the lyre-born chords extended harmonies of Lydian lays. And, thought I, lies scenes of pleasure where the free and blessed dwell, and each moment bears a treasure frighted with a lotus spell. And there floats a liquid measure from the lust of Israfel. There, I told myself, were shining words of happiness unknown, peace and innocence entwining. By the crowned vulture's throne, men of light, their thoughts refining, purer, fairer than my own. Thus, 
I mused when o'er the vision crept a red delirious change, hope dissolving to derision, beauty to distortion strange. Hymnic chords in weird collision, spectral sights in endless range. Crimson burned the star of madness as behind the beams I peer. All was woe that seemed but gladness ere my gaze with truth was seared. Cacodemons mired with madness through the fevered flickering leered. Now I know the fiendish fable the golden glitter bore. Now I shun the spangled saber that I watched and loved before. But the horror set and stable haunts my soul forevermore. The Hound by H.P. Lovecraft. In my tortured ears, there sounds unceasingly a nightmare whirring and flapping, and a faint, distant baying as of some gigantic hound. It is not a dream. It is not, I fear, even madness. For too much has already happened to give me these merciful doubts. St. John is a mangled corpse. I alone know why, and such is my knowledge that I am about to blow out my brains for fear I shall be mangled in the same way. Down unlit and illimitable corridors of eldritch fantasy sweeps the black, shapeless nemesis that drives me to self-annihilation. May heaven forgive the folly and morbidity which led us both to so monstrous a fate. Wearied with the commonplaces of a prosaic world, where even the joys of romance and adventure soon grew stale, St. John and I had followed enthusiastically every aesthetic and intellectual movement which promised respite from our devastating ennui. The enigmas of the symbolists and the ecstasies of the pre-Raphaelites all were ours in their time. But each new mood was drained too soon of its diverting novelty and appeal. Only the somber philosophy of the decadence could hold us, and this we found potent only by increasing gradually the depth and diabolism of our penetration. Baudelaire and Huismans were soon exhausted of thrills, till finally there remained for us only the more direct stimuli of unnatural personal experiences and adventures. It was this frightful emotion which need led us eventually to that detestable course which even in my present fear I mention with shame and timidity. That hideous extremity of human outrage, the abhorred practice of grave robbing. I cannot reveal the details of our shocking expeditions, or catalog even partly the worst of the trophies adorning the nameless museum we prepared in the great stone house where we jointly dwelt, alone, servantless. Our museum was a blasphemous, unthinkable place where with the satanic taste of neurotic virtuosi, we had assembled a universe of terror and decay to excite our jaded sensibilities. It was a secret room, far, far underground, where huge winged demons, carven of basalt and onyx, vomited from wide grinning mouths, weird green and orange light and hidden pneumatic pipes ruffled into kaleidoscopic dances of death, the lines of red, charnel things, hand in hand, woven in voluminous black hangings. Through these pipes came at will the odors of our moods most craved. Sometimes the scent of pale funeral lilies, sometimes 
the narcotic incense of imagined eastern shrines of the kingly dead. And sometimes, how I shudder to recall it, the frightful, soul-upheaving stenches of the uncovered grave. Around the walls of this repellent chamber were cases of antique mummies alternating with comely, lifelike bodies perfectly stuffed and cured by the taxidermist's art and with headstones snatched from the oldest churchyards of the world. Niches here and there contained skulls of all shapes and heads preserved in various stages of dissolution. There one might find the rotting, bald pates of famous noblemen and the fresh and radiantly golden heads of new-buried children. Statues and paintings there were, all of fiendish subjects, and some executed by St. John and myself. A locked portfolio bound in tanned human skin held certain unknown and unnameable drawings, which it was rumored Goya had perpetuated, but dared not acknowledge. There were nauseous musical instruments, stringed brass and woodwind, on which St. John and I sometimes produced dissonances of exquisite morbidity and cacodemoniacal ghastliness whilst in a multitude of inlaid ebony cabinets repose the most incredible and unimaginable variety of tomb loot ever assembled by human madness and perversity. It is of this loot in particular that I must not speak. Thank God I had the courage to destroy it long before I thought of destroying myself. The predatory excursions on which we collected our unmentionable treasures were always artistically memorable events. We were no vulgar ghouls, but worked only under certain conditions of mood, landscape, environment, weather, season, and moonlight. These pastimes were to us the most exquisite form of aesthetic expression and we gave their details a fastidious technical care. An inappropriate hour, a jarring lighting effect, or a clumsy manipulation of the damp sod would almost totally destroy for us that ecstatic titillation which followed the exhumation of some ominous, grinning secret of the earth. Our quest for novel scenes and piquant conditions was feverish and insatiable. St. John was always the leader, and he it was who led the way at last to that mocking, that accursed spot, which brought us our hideous and inevitable doom. By what malign fatality were we lured to that terrible Holland churchyard? I think it was the dark rumor and legendary the tales of once buried for five centuries, who had himself been a ghoul in his time and had stolen a potent thing from a mighty sepulcher. I recall the scene in these final moments, the pale autumnal moon over the graves casting long, horrible shadows, the grotesque trees drooping sullenly to meet the vast legions of strangely colossal bats that flew against the moon. The antique ivy church pointing a huge spectral finger at the livid sky. The phosphorescent insects that danced like death fires under the yews in a distant corner. The odors of mold, vegetation, and less explicable things that mingled feebly with the night wind from over far swamps and seas. And worst of all, the faint, deep-toned baying of some gigantic hound which we could neither see nor definitely place. 
As we heard this suggestion of baying, we shuddered, remembering the tales of the peasantry. For he who sought had centuries before been found in this self-same spot, torn and mangled by the claws and teeth of some unspeakable beast. I remembered how we delved in this ghoul's grave with our spades, and how we thrilled at the picture of ourselves, the grave, the pale watching moon, the horrible shadows, the grotesque trees, the titanic bats, the antique church, the dancing death fires, the sickening odors, the gently moaning night wind, and the strange, half-heard, directionless baying of whose objective existence we could scarcely be sure. Then we struck a substance harder than the damp mold and beheld a rotting oblong box crusted with mineral deposits in the long undisturbed ground. It was incredibly tough and thick, but so old that we finally pried it open and feasted our eyes on what it held. Much, amazingly much, was left of the object despite the lapse of 500 years. The skeleton, though crushed in places by the jaws of the thing that had killed it, held together with surprising firmness, and we gloated over the clean white skull and its long, firm teeth and its eyeless sockets that once had glowed with a charnel fever like our own. In the coffin lay an amulet of curious and exotic design which had apparently been worn around the sleeper's neck. It was the oddly conventionalized figure of a crouching winged hound, or sphinx, with a semi-canine face, and was exquisitely carved in antique oriental fashion from a small piece of green jade. The expression on its features was repellent in the extreme, savoring at once of death, bestiality, and malevolence. Around the base was an inscription in characters which neither St. John nor I could identify. And on the bottom, like a maker's seal, was graven a grotesque and formidable skull. Immediately upon beholding this amulet, we knew that we must possess it, that this treasure was our logical pelf from the century grave. Even had its outlines been unfamiliar, we would have desired it. But as we looked more closely, we saw that it was not wholly unfamiliar. Alien, indeed, was to all art and literature, which sane and balanced readers know. But we recognized it as the thing hinted of in the forbidden Necronomicon. The ghastly soul symbol of the corpse-eating cult of inaccessible Lang in Central Asia. All too well did we trace the sinister liniments described by the old demonologist. Liniments, he wrote, drawn from some obscure supernatural manifestation of the souls of those who vexed and gnawed at the dead. Seizing the green jade object, we gave a last glance at the bleached and carven-eyed face of its owner and closed up the grave as we had found it. As we hastened from that abhorrent spot, the stolen amulet in St. John's pocket, we thought we saw the bats descend in a body to the earth we had so lately rifled, as if seeking for some cursed and unholy nourishment. But the autumn moon shone weak and pale, and we could not be sure. So, too, as we sailed the next day away from Holland to our home, we thought we heard the faint, distant bang of some gigantic hound. But the autumn wind moaned, sad and wan, and we could not be sure. Less than a week, after our return to England, strange things began to happen. We lived as recluses, devoid of friends, 
alone and without servants in a few rooms of an ancient manor house on a bleak and unfrequented moor so that our doors were seldom disturbed by the knock of the visitor. Now, however, we were troubled by what seemed to be frequent fumblings in the night, not only around the doors, but around the windows also, upper as well as lower. Once we fancied that a large opaque body darkened the library window when the moon was shining against it. And another time, we thought we heard a whirring or flapping sound not far off. On each occasion, investigation revealed nothing, and we began to ascribe the occurrences to imagination alone. That same curiously disturbed imagination, which still prolonged in our ears the faint, far baying we thought we had heard in the Holland churchyard. The jade amulet now reposed in a niche in our museum and sometimes we burned strangely scented candles before it. We read much in the Necronomicon about its properties and about the relation of ghouls' souls to the objects it symbolized, and were disturbed by what we read. Then terror came. On the night of September 24th, I heard a knock at my chamber door. Fancying it St. John's, I bade the knocker enter, but was answered only by a shrill laugh. There was no one in the corridor. When I aroused St. John from his sleep, he professed entire ignorance of the event and became as worried as I. It was that night that in the faint, distant baying over the moor, became to us a certain and dreaded reality. Four days later, whilst we were both in the hidden museum, there came a low, cautious scratching at the single door which led to the secret library staircase. Our alarm was now divided, for besides our fear of the unknown, we had always entertained a dread that our grisly collection might be discovered. Extinguishing all lights, we proceeded to the door and threw it suddenly open. Whereupon, we felt an unaccountable rush of air, and heard, as if proceeding far away, a queer combination of rustling, tittering, and articulate chatter. Whether we were mad, dreaming, or in our senses, we did not try to determine. We only realized, with the blackest of apprehensions, that the apparent disembodied chatter was beyond a doubt in the Dutch language. After that, we lived in growing horror and fascination. Mostly, we held to the theory that we were jointly going mad from our life of unnatural excitement. But sometimes, it pleased us more to dramatize ourselves as the victims of some creeping and appalling doom. Bizarre manifestations were now too frequent to count. Our lonely house was seemingly alive with the presence of some malign being whose nature we could not guess. And every night, that demoniac baying rolled over the windswept moor, always louder and louder. On October 29th, we found in the soft earth beneath the library window a series of footprints, utterly impossible to describe. They were as baffling as the hordes of great bats which haunted the old manor house in unprecedented and increasing numbers. The horror reached the culmination on October 18th, when St. John, walking home after dark from the distant railway station, was seized by some frightful carnivorous thing and torn to ribbons. His screams had reached the house, and I had hastened to the terrible scene in time to hear a whir of wings and see a vague black cloudy thing silhouetted against the rising moon. 
my friend was dying when I spoke to him, and he could not answer coherently. All he could do was whisper, The amulet! That damn thing! Then he collapsed, an inert mass of mangled flesh. I buried him the next midnight in one of our neglected gardens and mumbled over his body one of the devilish rituals he had loved in life. And as I pronounced the last demoniac sentence, I heard afar on the moor the faint baying of some gigantic hound. The moon was up, but I dared not look at it. And when I saw on the dim litten moor a wide, nebulous shadow sweeping from mound to mound, I shut my eyes and threw myself face down upon the ground. When I arose trembling, I know not how much later, I staggered into the house and made shocking obeisances before the enshrined amulet of Jade. Being now afraid to live alone in the ancient house on the moor, I departed on the following day for London, taking with me the amulet, after destroying by fire the burial, the rest of the impious collection in the museum. But after three nights, I heard the baying again, and before a week was over, felt strange eyes upon me whenever it was dark. One evening, as I strolled on Victoria Embankment for some much-needed air, I saw a black shape obscure one of the reflections of the lamps in the water. A wind stronger than the night wind rushed by. And I knew that what had befallen St. John must soon befall me. The next day, I carefully wrapped the green jade amulet and sailed for Holland. What mercy I might gain by returning the thing to its silent, sleeping owner, I knew not. But I felt that I must at least try any step conceivably logical. What the hound was, and why it pursued me, were questions still vague. But I had first heard the baying in that ancient churchyard, and every subsequent event, including St. John's dying whisper, had served to connect the curse with the stealing of the amulet. Accordingly, I sank into the nethermost abysses of despair when, at an inn in Rotterdam, I discovered that thieves had despoiled me of this sole means of salvation. The baying was loud that evening, and in the morning I read of a nameless deed in the vilest quarter of the city. The rabble were in terror, for upon an evil tenement had fallen a red death beyond the foulest previous crime of the neighborhood. In a squalid thieves' den, an entire family had been torn to shreds by an unknown thing which left no trace, and those around had heard all night above the usual clamor of drunken voices, faint, deep, insistent note as of a gigantic hound. So at last I stood again in that unwholesome churchyard where a pale winter moon cast hideous shadows and leafless trees drooped sullenly to meet the withered frosty grass and cracking slabs. And the ivy church pointed a jeering finger at the unfriendly sky and the night wind howled maniacally from over frozen swamps and frigid seas. The baying was very faint now, and it ceased altogether as I approached the ancient grave I had once violated, and frightened away an abnormally large horde of bats which had been hovering curiously around it. I know not why I went thither unless to pray, or gibber out insane pleas and apologies to the calm white thing that lay within. But, whatever my reason, I attacked the half-frozen sod with a desperation partly mine and partly that of a dominating will outside myself. 
Excavation was much easier than I expected. Though, at one point, I encountered a queer interruption when a lean vulture darted down out of the cold sky and pecked frantically at the grave earth until I killed him with a blow of my spade. Finally, I reached the rotting oblong box and removed the damp nitrous cover. This is the last rational act I ever performed. For crouched within that centuried coffin, embraced by a close-packed nightmare retinue of huge, sinewy, sleeping bats, was the bony thing my friend and I had robbed. Not clean and placid as we had seen it then, but covered with caked blood and shreds of alien flesh and hair and leering sentient at me with phosphorescent sockets and sharp, ensanguinated fangs yawning twistedly in mockery of my inevitable doom. And when it gave from those grinning jaws a deep, sardonic bay as of some gigantic hound, and I saw that it held in its gory, filthy claw the lost and fateful amulet of green jade. I merely screamed and ran away idiotically, my screams soon dissolving into peals of hysterical laughter. Madness rides the star wind, claws and teeth sharpened on centuries of corpses, dripping death astride a bacchanal of bats from night-black ruins of buried temples of Belial. Now, as the baying of that dead, fleshless monstrosity grows louder and louder, and the stealthy whirring and flapping of those accursed web wings circles closer and closer, I shall seek with my revolver the oblivion, which is my only refuge from the unnamed and unnameable. Thank you for stopping by for this episode of Living Pages. Join us next time for more spooky adventures. Stay safe out there.